please rise. This evening we'll be following the order of service as it's found inside your bulletin. Merciful Father in heaven, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer in order that we may walk with your son, Jesus Christ, through the eyes and steps of Peter. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins and speak to our hearts. O Spirit, dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word and receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. We begin our Lenten worship in the name of the triune God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord Almighty, grant us who have gathered in your word a quiet and peaceful night. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the singing of the opening hymn, hymn 151, verses 1 through 5.
please rise. We join to confess our sins and to hear the Lord's absolution or forgiveness for those sins through his own suffering and death and the words of the confession as it's found in your bulletin. While Jesus was on trial, Peter denied three times that he knew Jesus. This was just before Jesus was put to death. After Jesus had risen from the dead, he appeared to Peter and asked him, Do you love me more than these? We who have denied our Savior in our sinful thoughts, words, and deeds can respond with Peter in sorrowful repentance. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Yes, yes Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. In this manner, our Lord Jesus brings to Peter's mind and to our own minds our denial of our Savior by our sins. But we also see our Lord Jesus forgive Peter for his sins and restore him in his grace, mercy, and love. Therefore, I announce this grace, mercy, and love of our God and Savior to each one of you. And in his stead and by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 seated. The reading of the Passion History of our Savior continues this evening with part five, the humble king. The trial that Jesus then goes through 
before Pilate and the results of that trial. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers of the governor led Jesus away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together and gathered around him the whole garrison. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, clothing him in purple. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and worshipped him, mocking him. They saluted him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head with it. And they struck him with their hands. And when they had mocked him, Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, about 6 a.m. Roman time. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And so Pilate delivered Jesus to their will. He delivered him to them to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus' purple robe off him and put on his own clothes. They took Jesus and led him out to crucify him, and he, bearing his cross, went out. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was coming from the country. On him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others, criminals, led away with him to be put to death. And they brought him to the place called Calvary, in Hebrew, Golgotha, which is the place of a skull. And when they had come there, they gave him sour wine mingled with myrrh and gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. He did not take it. Here ends the portion five of our Passion reading. Please rise as we join to make confession of our faith. This year, as we have focused on walking with Peter during this Lenten season, our confession has been taken from Peter's own confession in his own epistle. We'll be using the words of 2 Peter chapter 3 as our confession of faith. 
The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. But in keeping with Jesus' promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness, bearing in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with the wisdom that God gave him, that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 408. <laughs> to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Fear. Fear is something that we're all familiar with. A number of weeks ago in school I asked the kids what they were afraid of. The answers that were given were among the top 10 things that are listed of fears among human beings. We got spiders, snakes, heights, all among the top five of fears that people have. There are a few other things that the kids also mentioned that they were afraid of. You think about when we're little, afraid of the dark. Fear is something that plays a very important role in our lives. It's almost always present. 
where we're concerned about the things that are going on around us. It doesn't matter if it's snakes or spiders or if it's heights or darkness, enclosed spaces like claustrophobia, fear of being in crowded areas where there's a lot of people around us, all kinds of examples. But when you start to look at those fears that people have, you begin to realize that there's, there's a lack of sense with many of the fears that we have. For example, the fear of the dark. Many times when our children are little, they have this fear of the dark, but in reality, there's nothing to be afraid of. The dark doesn't hurt anybody. Or you think about spiders. For example, one of the most common spiders that people are afraid of are tarantulas. Huge, ugly spiders. They are really great for horror movies and all kinds of scary movies, but in reality, Tarantulas do not have a poison that can actually hurt a human being. The chances of somebody being hurt by a tarantula are actually more likely to have an allergic reaction to their hair than to actually be hurt by their bite. And so when we begin to look at the fears that we have in life, when we really start to look at them, we realize that many times our fears are unfounded that they're not based on reality, but on what we perceive in the world around us. Over the course of this midweek Lenten season, we have been reflecting on Peter's walk with Jesus. We're looking at before and after photos. A lot of times we like before and after photos. You like to watch maybe home improvement shows and you get a before picture of the house and then an after picture of the house. And sometimes people say, I can't believe that's the same house. Or they see a before and after photo of a person who gets a hairdo or maybe loses a bunch of weight. We look at these before and after photos. And that's what we've been doing this Lenten season with Peter. We've been looking at a before picture of Peter and an after picture of Peter. And as we take a look at those two things, we see very striking differences before and after. Like with most before and after photos, we generally don't envy the before photos. We generally envy the after photos, the change that has taken place. This evening, we consider Peter's change from fear to faith. The words which we are considering are found in Matthew chapter 26, verses 57 and 58. This can be found on page 7 in your bulletin near the bottom of the page. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. You might notice that the word fear isn't found in the verses of our text, but there is an important phrase that's found in there that indicates fear. There Matthew tells us that Peter followed him, that is Jesus, at a distance. We've been reflecting on the events leading up to our text throughout this Lenten midweek service. We've heard all of the things that have taken place that led up to Jesus going, being taken into custody, tried, Peter sleeking in the shadows, following along behind in order to see the end or the outcome. When we reflect on everything that has taken place, and we back up about two or three weeks or so and take a look at what led up to this event, we might say, well, we can understand why Peter was fearful. In the Gospel of John, we can back up to the, the days right before Palm Sunday. We're told that Jesus was up in Galilee to the north. And while he was up in Galilee, he heard news that his friend Lazarus was sick. We know how that account turned out. Jesus delayed his return to see Lazarus and Lazarus died. And after he found out that Lazarus had died, he told his disciples, we're going to go back to Jerusalem, Bethany was just down the hill, to see Lazarus. And the disciples couldn't believe it. 
They said, what are you thinking? The last time we were in Jerusalem, they wanted to stone you and put you to death. And Jesus said, we have to go. And so Thomas turns to the other disciples and he tells them, he says, let us also go with him that we might die with him. Now, those verses indicate that the disciples understood that there was a certain amount of danger being associated with Jesus. They had seen the events in the ministry of Jesus where they were going to throw him off a cliff. They were going to stone him to death. They no doubt knew what the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders, were hoping to do with Jesus. And so we might take a look at the events and say, well, of course, Peter would be fearful. Earlier on Monday, Thursday evening, Peter was with Jesus in the garden. And when Judas led the crowd into the garden in order to take Jesus into custody, you remember Peter pulled out his sword in order to defend Jesus. But that didn't last long. Jesus told him to put his sword away. He said, this isn't the way. And then we're told that all the disciples fled. Fulfilling the prophecy that Jesus had spoken earlier that very night when he said, they will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Fear. Fear leads to all kinds of other consequences or results. We heard about how fear led Peter to deny deny that he even knew Jesus because of the fear that he had of associating himself with the man who was on trial before the Jews. Fear. We might say that there's nothing wrong with fear, that there are times where it's okay to be fearful. And yet when we take a look at the scriptures themselves, we find that the concept of fear is found all over. And whenever we find those concepts of fear, we always find God speaking to his people and telling them, fear not. It starts with Abraham. The Lord had called Abraham out of Ur, and he says, I'm going to take you to a new land. I'm going to give you descendants. I'm going to give you possessions. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bring about the Savior through you. And when Abraham saw the dangers that confronted him, when he thought about the things that he was leaving behind, the Lord told Abraham, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm going to be with you. And the Lord repeated that promise to his son Isaac and to his son Jacob. 400 years later, when the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, were now in Egypt, and Moses is sent to Egypt, the Lord again goes to his people and he says, don't be afraid. I am with you. Don't be afraid of that massive army of the Egyptians. I'm going to take care of them. When they're in the wilderness with no food, no water, the Lord says, don't be afraid. It's this common theme that we see throughout the Old Testament where God repeats the message, do not be afraid, over and over and over again to Joshua, to the various judges that he appointed and led to deliver his people, to the kings, to the prophets, to the prophet Isaiah, the Lord says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Fear not. There were plenty of things to be afraid of throughout the years and centuries of the Old Testament, and yet God's message was a clear and concise one to his people. Do not be afraid. Jesus had a similar message to his own disciples. That was repeated time and time again to his own disciples. Whether they were out on the Sea of Galilee with a great storm raging over the waters, Jesus said, don't be afraid. And then with a word, he calms the storm and the boat arrives safely at the seashore. Don't be afraid. This theme starts in Genesis, goes all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, and then comes to the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 2, John writes, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and 
I will give you the crown of life. The Apostle Paul in Romans also speaks about the need to not be afraid. He says, what is it that man is capable of doing to us if we are in the hands of the one who controls all things? What can man do to us? As human beings, we have two problems when it comes to fear. The first problem is that we fear things that we shouldn't fear. Fear, many times, is a result of not realizing that God is in control. That he has control over anything and everything that we might face in this life. Which is why the Lord repeats time and time again, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, do not fear. It's easy for us to fall into that trap of fear, though. The other problem that we have as human beings is the opposite, though. Many times we fail to fear what we should fear. Jesus tells his disciples, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Isn't it interesting how we have both of those problems as human beings? That either we don't respect God and as a result we fear things that we shouldn't be afraid of. Or on the other side, we don't fear or respect God as we should. And we put more confidence or trust in the things of the world around us. It doesn't matter which side we fall into. The Lord reminds us that that problem is something that is part of our human nature. And understanding and knowing who Jesus is and what he has done for us is the solution for both of those problems in our life. Peter was afraid. From a human perspective, we might say he had every right to be afraid. But if we look at things a little bit more clearly, we might say, did he really? If Jesus... If Jesus was there, and if Peter would have been there and said, I want to go with Jesus, do you think they would have killed Peter too? Probably not. In the events in the days following the resurrection of Jesus, to begin with, there was still a little bit of fear. After his resurrection, we're told that the apostles were all gathered in an upper room behind locked doors, and Luke tells us very clearly, for fear of the Jews. That fear had still was still conquering them. But there was a change that took place. A change from fear to faith because as we look at Peter after the resurrection of Jesus, we see a different kind of Peter. As we read through the book of Acts, we find Peter out and about on Pentecost. The Holy Spirit gives them the ability to speak in other languages and the people are gathered around and asking, what is going on? And on Pentecost, Peter doesn't he doesn't waver from who it is that he is speaking about. He says, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he did. And he also proclaims very boldly the law. He says, you crucified that Jesus whom God raised from the dead for your salvation. Repent and believe. Thousands of people were brought to faith on that day. We flip the page in the book of Acts and we go to Acts chapter 3 and again we find Peter and John walking on their way to the temple and they heal a lame man and it gathers a crowd of people and they're all wondering what is it that happened and Peter again takes that opportunity to say let me tell you about Jesus because I didn't do this, Jesus did this. And the Jesus that did this is the one whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead for your salvation. The chief priests and scribes heard a ruckus in the temple and sent the guards in and brought Peter and James or John back to them and said, what is it that you're doing? And they said, well, we're just telling people about Jesus, this man in whom there is no other salvation among men. And they said, you can't do that. You can't talk about that Jesus. And Peter, in essence, said, try and stop us. We ought to obey God rather than men. And so they went right back out into the temple once again. A couple of chapters later, not only Peter and John, but all of the apostles are arrested and thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. 
for bearing witness of that Jesus. And an angel comes in, unlocks their chains, and sends them out and says, go back where you were and continue preaching the gospel, which is exactly what they did. We take a look at this before and after photo of Peter. Fear in the Garden of Gethsemane. Fear in the courtyard of the high priest. Boldness in the courtyard of the temple. Boldness in Jerusalem. And we ask, what happened? What was the change that took place and what brought it about? And when we took, take a look at those two pictures, when we see the before and after photos of Peter, which is the one that we want to be like? Do we want to be like Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane? Do we want to be like Peter in the courtyard of the high priest? Or do we want to be like that Peter in the temple and in Jerusalem, boldly proclaiming Jesus and bringing thousands of people to know who he is and to faith and to desire baptism? It's not the before picture that we want. We envy that after picture of Peter. What was it that took place to change Peter? A knowledge of what Jesus had done for him and how important it was. Those words that we used earlier on in our service, the confession of our sins and the words of Jesus giving absolution to Peter, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. Jesus changed Peter. He brought him to understand the importance of what he had done for Peter and for the rest of the world. The change that took place in Peter was based on a couple of things. Number one, understanding the gospel. Understanding what it was that Jesus really had come to do when he died on the cross. What the meaning of the crucifixion was and what the meaning of his empty tomb was. Without an understanding or appreciation of what Jesus came to do, we will never be left from fear and brought to faith. That plays an important role. But the second part was a love for his Savior. A love for the Savior who had given his life for him. Who had looked at him when he denied him. Looking at him. You wonder what those eyes looked like as Jesus saw Peter after denying him three times and Peter went out and wept bitterly. Those same eyes that came to Peter and said, feed my sheep. The Lord comes to us in our sin and also offers us that forgiveness that he has won, an appreciation and a love for that Savior who has loved us to such a great degree. But there's a third thing that also led Peter to this change. Not only was it an appreciation for what Jesus had done and an understanding and a love for his Savior, but also a love for his fellow human beings. An understanding that without that knowledge of who Jesus is and what he has come to do, they were going to be lost eternally. Peter didn't get up on Pentecost and get up in the temple just simply, just simply out of love for his Savior, but also out of love for those who didn't know who Jesus was and with an understanding of what was going to happen if they didn't come to know that Jesus as their Savior from sin as well. Many times, phobias defy rationality. They defy reality. And the Lord reminds us in the fears that we have in this life that He is bigger, He is greater, He is more powerful. He leads us to an understanding of His gospel just as He did with Peter, bringing us from fear to faith giving us a love for that Savior who has given his life not only for Peter, but for each one of us. And a love for our fellow men who also have been redeemed by that same Savior. The same Spirit that worked in Peter and brought him from fear to faith is the same Spirit that is still alive and well and working in our hearts today, desiring to bring about that same change in each one of us to lead us out of fear to faith faith and confidence and trust in the one true God and all that he has done and accomplished for us. May we envy, but also rejoice in the work of the Savior in Peter and in each one of us. 
and go forward in confidence and with assurance that we too might have the same faith that Peter had, boldly proclaiming the one and only Savior from sin. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
please rise. We'll be following the order of service here as the introduction to our prayers. In addition to our general prayer for this evening, prayers of thanksgiving have been also requested on behalf of the Omen family. The Lord blessed them with the gift of a son early this morning, about five o'clock, James Leland. Lord willing, they will be coming home tomorrow and we'll have a baptism coming up in the next couple of weeks. We give the Lord thanks for the safe delivery of a baby. We pray. Let our prayer be set before you as incense and the lifting up of our hands as the evening sacrifice. O oh Lord Jesus, we know that the trials, the sufferings, the humiliation, and the bitter agony and death which you endured were all for us. You were willing to carry the burden of our sins in your own body and to feel the terrible weight of their guilt upon your conscience. You were even willing to sacrifice yourself to pay the debt of our sins to give us access to God. It is with deep sadness and repentant hearts that we think about our many sins. We are filled though with joy when we think of your cross, knowing that it is the altar upon which you secured our redemption. How richly blessed we are. Although we have sinned against God in countless ways and times without number, yet your suffering and death have opened for us the door to eternal life. How compassionate you are to give your life for us, your sheep. Precious Savior, grant us grace to always remember in true faith and with repentant hearts what you in love have done for us. Give us willingness and strength to follow you on our journey of faith, even through fear and suffering, to the eternal joy which you have secured for us. Be with us in every temptation. Help us to overcome each one so that we might glorify you with a godly life and a steadfast faith. Keep us from caving into the pressures of the world around us or the concerns of our own sinful flesh. Prevent us from becoming careless and indifferent in spiritual matters and from the study of your word through which your spirit helps us to overcome our fears and our weaknesses and the desires of our own flesh. Grant that our spirits may always be filled with watchfulness and prayer. Forgive all our sins, for you have suffered and died for them. We also ask on behalf of the Omen family, in your word you have reminded us that sons are a heritage from the Lord and that children are a reward from you. We praise your name for bestowing upon Josh and Hannah this joy-filled blessing. We come before you in thankfulness that you have kept Hannah uh, continually in your grace and protection and that you have given them a healthy son. We continue to ask for your blessing, asking that you would protect and sustain James throughout his life. We ask that you would cause him to be born again of water and the spirit, that in faith and love for you, his savior, he might serve your name here on earth and in eternity share with the angels and all believers the glories of heaven. May he always be filled with your grace and spirit, that he might continue to be a joy and a blessing to his parents and others by walking the paths of righteousness throughout the days of his life. All of these things we humbly ask to the glory and praise of your holy name, in which we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 